You cite a tired brain, foggy thinking, as the reason to stop answering questions or giving a talk. How do you combat this while working or writing daily? Well, I eat a big breakfast relatively soon on waking. That really helps. If any of you out there are anxious, and many of you no doubt are, there'll be a large number of you who are anxious and don't eat breakfast. And there'll be a whole bunch of you out there who think, well, I don't eat breakfast. It isn't necessary. It's like, that's wrong. It's necessary. You fasted all night. If you load yourself cognitively or physiologically in the morning, your brain stressed will produce will encourage your body to produce insulin. It will take all the blood sugar out of your blood, and then you're done for the day. And then you'll be anxious. And another, a lot of the rest of you, too, you'll find if you're anxious, try this. It's really, really interesting th experiment. The next time you're anxious, go eat something. Eat, like, uh, eat some protein and fat would be best. You could have cheese and crackers. I'm not a big fan of carbohydrates, but whatever. Eat whatever you're willing to eat, but make it solid. Don't eat a peanut butter or don't eat a, like a chocolate bar or something sweet. Eat something substantial, a piece of meat, a piece of cheese, some peanut butter, something like that. And then wait 10 minutes and see if you're less anxious. And try that for like two weeks. Every time you get anxious, eat something. Because then you can find out if your anxiousness, if your anxiety is linked to low blood sugar. And it's very likely that it is, especially if you also get irritable and foggy in your thinking. And so, and... The best way to treat that, as far as I've been able to tell, and there's a decent literature on this, is to make sure that you eat a big breakfast. And you might say, well, I'm not hungry in the morning. It's like, who the hell cares if you're hungry? I didn't say enjoy your breakfast. I said eat it. That's not the same thing. You know, there's lots of things that you need to do that you don't enjoy to begin with. You'll get hungry in six months, and then you'll start to enjoy it. So that's a massive difference. I take small naps quite frequently if I'm wiped out. You know, I'll go have a nap for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And then that helps quite a lot. I try to wake up fairly regular, on a fairly regular schedule. That's another thing I would really recommend for people whose lives are in disarray and who are anxious. Try to fix your wake time. Sleep, going when you sleep, that's not so important. So you can still, you know, stay up late and have fun and all that. But getting up in the morning is really helpful. So, you know, and you, you also have to figure out how much you can work or write. I can't write for more than about max. My sustainable maximum for writing is three hours a day. And if I push it past that, then especially if I'm editing, I, I make mistakes when I'm editing, so that's counterproductive, and I can't sustain it across time. And so I don't really think you can do more than about three hours of extremely intense intellectual work a day. Although if you have a nap, you can stretch that, but I think at least I end up paying for it across time. So nap... Make sure you eat and make sure that you get enough sleep. So that's that's how I combat it and try to make myself hyper-efficient. What does my average daily schedule consist of? Well, that's fairly straightforward. I get up around somewhere between 6 and 8, and then I work till 10, as, as hard as I can, flat out, every single day. So, and I've been doing that for with very little variation, although it's been much more extreme in the last year for, like, since 1985. Like, I work probably, well, I work, I would say, 14 hours a day, at least 14 hours a day. And so that's about 100 hours a week. And uh, the time that I don't do that, I spend with friends, and but mostly with my family. And so, um, yeah, and I work as efficiently as I possibly can. I'm always trying to do everything I can as fast as I possibly can. And I'm accustomed to that because like I said, I've been doing it for I've been doing it for 30 years. So that's my daily schedule and and I don't know even what I would do if I didn't do that. Um I I have this cottage that I go to, although I generally spend time writing up there and I go swimming with my wife and we go canoeing and and I can take a break in that way, but most of the time if I take a break even up at the cottage, generally what I do is like carpentry and fix the place up. And I don't like to be unoccupied. I have to be occupied doing something productive all the time because otherwise I'm not pleased with myself. And so, and you know, I decided a long time ago that I was going to try to live a hyper-efficient and hyper-productive life. And so it's been a challenge. I, it's an enjoyable thing for me to some degree because I'm very interested in trying to figure out how much I can possibly do in the shortest period of time all the time. It's, it's unbelievable the degree to which our sanity depends on a functioning sociological structure. And, and here's why. 
Well, first of all, you kind of need to know what to do every day. You have to have a routine because you're an animal, you know. And, you know, if you have a dog or a cat, dogs are a really good example of this. Dogs like routine. They like to be walked the number of times a day that they're supposed to be walked. And they get quite sick very rapidly if you don't, if you don't routinize their, their days. Children are exactly the same way. Now, you can overdo it, right? But still, you know, you need to know approximately when you should get up. It should be approximately the same every day. You need to know approximately you're going, when you're going to eat. You need to know what you're going to eat. You need to know who you're going to eat with. You need to know where to buy your food. It's like 80% of your life, 70% of your life, something like that, consists of those things that you do every single day, that you repeat. Well, so you need structure, you need predictability, and you need more of it than you think, just to keep you sane. Now, if you're lucky, and, and maybe a bit odd, you can deviate 5% from the norm, or 10% from the norm, or something like that, carefully and cautiously, as long as the rest of you is all well-ordered in a normative manner. You might be able to get away with that, and you might be able to sustain it across time, and people might be able to tolerate you if you do it, or maybe you'll get really lucky and you happen to be creative, but reasonably well put together, and people will actually be happy that there's something idiosyncratic and unique about you. But even under those circumstances, mostly what you want is to have a routine that's disciplined, that's predictable, and bloody well stick to it. You're going to be way healthier and happier and saner if you do that. And then the other thing that you need, because... This is one of the things the psychoanalysts got wrong, I think, is that they overestimated the degree to which sanity was a consequence of internal, of being properly structured internally, you know? Because from the psychoanalytic point of view, you're sort of an ego, and that ego is inside you. And of course, it rests on an unconscious structure, but the purpose of psychoanalysis is to sort out that unconscious structure and the ego on top of it, and to make you a fully functioning and autonomous individual. But there's a problem with that because the reason that you're sane as a fully functional and autonomous human being isn't because you've organized your psyche, even though that's important. The reason that you're sane if, you're a we if you have a well-organized unconscious and ego is because other people can tolerate having you around for reasonably extensive periods of time and will cuff you across the back of the head every time you do something so stupid that people will dislike you permanently if you continue. And so what people are doing to each other all the time, just nonstop, is broadcasting sanity signals back and forth, right? It's like you smile at people if they're, well, if they're not, not only behaving properly, but behaving in a way that you would like to see them continue to behave. You frown at them if they're not, you ignore them if they're not, you shun them, you, you roll your eyes at them, you manifest a disgust face, you don't listen to them, you interrupt them, you won't cooperate with them, you won't compete with them. It's like you're blasting signals at other people about how to regulate their behavior so frequently, well, it just makes up all of your social interaction. That's why we face each other and we have emotional displays on our face and we're looking at each other's eyes and we know exactly we know as much as we can about what's going on with each other, given that we don't have immediate access to the contents of their consciousness. And so partly what you're doing with your routine is establishing yourself as a credible, reliable, trustworthy, potentially interesting human being who isn't going to do anything too erratic at any moment. And everyone else is around there tapping you into shape, making sure that that's exactly what you are. And that's how you stay sane. And so what happens to people too if they don't have a routine and they get isolated as they start to drift. And they drift badly because the world is too complicated for you to keep it organized all by yourself. You just cannot do it. So a lot of our, so we outsource the problem of sanity. And it's very intelligent that we outsource the problem of sanity because sanity is an impossibly complex problem. And so the way that we manage the incredibly complex problem is we have a very large number of brains working simultaneously on the problem all the time. And that efficiency thing is really fun if you guys who are listening are out for a challenge. Like one of the things that you can, I think this heightens the meaning in your life, is to try to do difficult things, right? Aim high. Don't aim so damn high you can't manage it and make sure you break down your aims into reasonably attainable sub goals but you want to aim high and then you want to see how hyper efficient you can get that's a great thing to do in your early 20s is to see okay like 
discipline yourself. You think, okay, how much work can I do if I load myself right to the maximum? How far do I, how far can I work? How hard can I work until I exhaust myself? And then you back off, obviously, because the optimal amount of working, productive engagement, let's say, is that which is sustainable across decades. So you have to, you have to learn that, but you don't learn that without stretching yourself to your limits to begin with. And, you know, if your life isn't everything it could be, and if you're suffering from an excess of meaninglessness, well, it means you're not oriented in the world of chaos and order properly. It's like you could learn to discipline yourself. Look, figure out what figure out what it is that you need to do and that you want to do, and then see how efficient you can get. Because one of the things that's quite fun is to figure out, if you have a task, I always tell my graduate students this, if they're doing an experiment too, if you have a task that you have to do, it's really interesting to spend a few minutes sometimes hours, depending on how long the task is, see if you can figure out how to do it from, from five to ten times faster. It means you'll have to rearrange the way you think about it, but you can often do it. And that's how extremely productive people get so hyper-efficient.